So February 10th to March 2023, uh, what are we going to see? Next slide, please, Michael. Okay. Venus is in the southwest after sunset. It's sitting there. Uh, it is coming out from behind the sun and moving east. Jupiter and Mars, which most of you I'm sure saw tonight, we're going this way around the sun, so they appear to be moving towards the sun. And Venus is chasing us and catching up to us. One more click. So February 21st and 22nd, the moon is going to go by Venus and Jupiter. They're closing. Venus is closing in on Jupiter right now. Next one. And the moon will go by Mars on the 27th. Most of the slide, the pictures I'm going to show are screenshots from Stellarium, and I've set it up for 7 p.m., 1900 hours. Not being a morning person, uh, I'm not interested in what comes up in the morning sky because I look west and all I can see is trees. And I don't want to get up that early. And there's no planets out there anyway. Mercury's below the horizon. If you're in Australia, it's glorious. But in the Northern Hemisphere, it sucks. Again? Yeah, okay, here we are. Venus and Jupiter, March 1st. This is going to be close. Um, half a degree is the width of the moon. Or the width of your little fingernail at arm's length, or an aspirin tablet held between thumb and forefinger, half a degree, or the width of the sun. Lovely coincidence. But that's pretty close. And all four of Jupiter's big moons will be visible up and to the left at about 11 o'clock relative to Jupiter's disk. Um, Venus, of course, is so bright, and there are, I've never been able to see any kind of features on it. Uh, I'm sure some people with better scopes, better seeing, better eyesight and filters might see something, but I can't. So it's just a searchlight. Okay, next. ZTF is still visible. And tonight, it's close to Mars. So I expect everybody with binoculars to scoot home and fall over backwards while you're trying to look at that comet right next to Mars with binoculars. The toughest thing about finding a comet, at least for me, is, was it over here or over there? With Neowise, yeah. A blind man could tell where it was, but these things are not easy to see. Okay, next one. And just like last month, high tides right around new moon. And apropos of Bruce's talk about orbits and how stable they are or aren't, Anybody with the observer's handbook, go through it month by month. And they put down the dates and the distances for lunar uh, apogee and perigee, okay? And they're not the same. It's doing this twice a year. I plotted it and it, it has to do with interference from the sun, I'm sure. How it works like that, I don't know. I'm going to try and figure it out. Okay, next slide, please. So there's a Stellarium screenshot as of one hour and 55 minutes ago. 
All right. Well, for those of us sitting here, I can wiggle the mouse around. There's Venus. There's Jupiter. It's clicked on in Stellarium, which is why it has the little four red things, and Mars. And one of the things I've started doing, and didn't do it for the first year or so, is turn on the ecliptic. It really helps me get my head straight. And you can see we're coming up to springtime, and it's at quite an angle to the horizon, which, of course, is down here. So that's what you would have seen two hours ago. Next one, please. Okay, uh, crescent moon, February 21st, very new moon. And this is 7 p.m. local time. So you got the moon about five degrees above the horizon, 10 degrees is Venus, and about 12 or 13 is Jupiter. And for those who like to take nice astrophotos, that will be a very scenic conjunction, semi-conjunction. Next one, please, Michael. Now on the 22nd, the moon will pass Jupiter. And because its orbit isn't exactly coplanar with the ecliptic, it, it's above or below, it always is. <coughs> But that is, uh, let's see, I uh, wiped out the degree references, but the moon's half a degree wide, so they're about two degrees apart. Very thin crescent. And, next slide please, if you have really good binoculars or a telescope, this is a blown up shot of Jupiter. You can see Callisto down at the bottom, and you'll notice all the moons are in the same plane as the ecliptic, because Jupiter, that's how it rolls. It basically rotates straight up, and its moons go around like that. <clears throat> so the whole thing is tipped. Callisto on the bottom, then Jupiter, Io and Europa are side by each, about one and a half diameters. And then Ganymede is up to the top left. You won't be able to pick Io and Europa, or Eel, uh, apart with a pair of binoculars, but a good scope, you should. And if you have image stabilized binoculars, you can generally see them easy. It's the shaking that screws us all up, at least me. Okay, next one. Thanks, Mike. February 27th, Moon and Mars. Now, Mars is past opposition. It's lost a good deal of its luminosity, uh, but it's still pretty cool up there. It's right up here beside Aldebaran, a little bit brighter, and it's pink. So all of these shots are for 9 p.m. This is for February 27th. And next one, please, Mike. And this is cool. This is March 1st. Venus is going to boogie past Jupiter. And it, it moves distinctly night by night. You can see it. Um, and all four of Jupiter's moons are in that same plane up to about the 11 o'clock from Jupiter's planet, planetary body. And uh, they're all on one side. Now, that's going to be a tough catch without a telescope uh, because they're pretty close in. However, that is less than half a degree. So if you can see, um, I've got an eight inch mead and 
I think with the 50 millimeter, my field of view is just over one degree. So you'd be able to see everything in the same field of view. And with binoculars, of course, obviously, because you don't have that kind of magnification. Okay, next, please. This is a little shot taken from uh, the Heavens Dash Above website. If you click on comets and click on the uh, ZTF one, it's apparently magnitude 6.2 right now. It was down as low as 5.6, I think, but it's faded a bit. And this is for tonight. That's a, I believe, a five degree square. So it's within a degree of Mars. That's the width of your thumbnail. So if you can find Mars, you can find the comet. So homework for everybody is zoom home and grab the binocs and don't do like I do and fall over backwards when you look over your head. And to those of you who've heard my repeated distinctions between weather and climate change, uh, next slide, please. Yep. Yeah. Yes, it's a little thing with the four fingers sticking out the side. They don't actually look like that. But yeah, I thought they did. Nope. It's right beside Mars, right up there. It may well be. I, I spent two hours trying to import the damn orbital data into Stellarium struck out and it was like, oh hell. So boom, just grab the first screenshot I could. Yeah, okay. And again. That was Yogi Berra who said that. It's like deja vu all over again. He also said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. So that was a picture taken in December, and that is the Davis Bay Pier. And I can guarantee you nobody on a kayak went underneath the pier that morning. That was 10 minutes after peak high tide all the driftwood was floating and it's going to be not quite that high again. But what's happening is uh, lunar perigee, so it's as close to the Earth as it gets, pardon me, during that month. And we're at our closest to the sun on January 4th. And at new moon, everything is in a line, so all the forces add. And tidal forces vary inversely as the cube of the distance between the bodies. So we're closer to the sun, the moon is closer to us, everything goes up and you get a 30% increase in the tides. There's a lot of complications to it. Latitude has an effect. Uh, you get resonance in certain bodies of water like Cook Inlet and the Bay of Fundy. Uh, it's really nerdy, all the corrections you have to make to do proper tidal estimates and so on. So the people who can do that, my hat's off to them. Okay, um, that's all we can see. <laughs>